Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted forty days and forty nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. The dramatic cosmic battle, if you will, is played out for us in the Gospel lesson where in a very real and also human way, Jesus is caught between a rock and a hard place. He's just come from his ordination ceremony, his baptism, where his heavenly father affirms him and his divine mission. Well, no sooner has the water dried on his forehead than Jesus is led by the spirit out of the wilderness where Satan's basic goal is to sabotage God's plan. Find some way to drive an arrow into the heart of Jesus and you effectively derail the train from the track. But it's not food changing stones into bread. That is the real temptation Satan places before Jesus. And it's not power riches offering Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. That is the real temptation Satan places before Jesus. Nor is it an issue of his safety. If he, if he throws himself off the pinnacle of the temple, the temptation that Satan places before Jesus is to see if his heart will remain true to the plan, whether he will be loyal to his Father in heaven, and whether their relationship can hold up under the pressure. Did you notice what word that Satan uses to drive this wedge between Jesus' heart and God's? Satan says, if you are the Son of God, then command the stones to become bread. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. If Satan can get Jesus to to second guess the whole thing, if he can get Jesus to doubt, even for a second, the authenticity of his mission, then Satan has his foot in the door and stands a chance of succeeding. If you really are who you think you are, Jesus, then prove it. It's no big deal, really. Just, just change a few stones into bread, and, and it's true, that would have satisfied Jesus' physical hunger but it would have substituted his human will for God's will. Just bow down before me once, Jesus, and earthly power will be yours. Well, even if Jesus believed Satan had the authority to do this, and Jesus knew he would have to sell his soul to get it. Jesus, just throw yourself off from here. God won't let you hurt yourself. Prove your trust in him. Come on, Jesus, where's your faith? Would God have saved him if he had jumped? Well, sure. And Jesus could have walked into the rest of his ministry with absolute certainty that God would take care of him. But what would that have done to the nature of the relationship between Jesus and his father, which was one of trust? You see, Satan really had one goal. Give Jesus a heart attack. Aim his arrow into the core of his being. Get Jesus to question, to doubt, to wonder, to hesitate. And that bond between the Father and the Son would weaken. That's what happens to us a lot of the time, too. 
You can call it Satan or simply our human nature, which tries to find a way to ensnare the heart, making us incapable of the love affair that God wants to have with us. And so let me ask you this question. How many of you believe in fairy tales? Well, let's talk about Cinderella. As you remember, Cinderella lives with her stepsisters, a shrewish pair who makes her sleep with the coal in the furnace room and have her convinced that she would never be anything more than a maid. Now, one can't help but ask as the story moves on, doesn't Cinderella see her own beauty, her own value, which the story makes quite obvious? Can't she sense that she is different from her stepsisters, both inside and out? Why doesn't she understand what is so apparent? But the voices of the stepsisters are loud and convincing, and Cinderella just can't see it. She continues to take their abuse and serve them right up until comes the invitation to the prince's ball. And when Cinderella shyly suggests that she might like to tag along, the stepsisters mock her to scorn for thinking that she would fit in with people of such grace and beauty. As she helps stuff them into their costumes and does her best to hide their ugliness, they continue to mock her foolishness and thinking that the prince would ever want anything to do with her. Well, when Grace comes along in the form of Cinderella's fairy godmother and dresses her in this beautiful gown and she does finally look into the mirror and she sees clearly her great beauty, but she believes it is all due to magic. Of course, the prince, when she gets to the ball, recognizes her as the one that he's been looking for all his life. He, he spends the evening dancing with her, totally enraptured in her presence. And as the clock strikes 12, Cinderella fears being exposed for the homely housemaid she believes she is, and she runs from the room, losing a glass slipper in the process. And even though she still has the other glass slipper in her possession, she does not come forward. And she hears the prince is searching the city for the one who can wear the dainty shoe. Once again, the stepsister's voice convinced her she is contemptible in soul and body, good only for the homeliest of tasks. Fortunately for Cinderella, the prince is a romantic who will not give up searching the city until he finds her. Eventually, he does find her, and they live happily ever after. Dear ones, this is not a fairy tale at all. It is a story of the great romance between God and us and how it is being sabotaged. You see, something within our human nature wants to keep us in rags and mopping floors, believing that we are worth nothing more than that of a housemaid. The mirror of our lives becomes blurred so we can't see who we really are. Redeemed, transformed, beautiful. We become blind to who God has made us to be. We can't see this new child of God because we've been convinced we are not worthy to be a child of God. And so when the invitation to the ball comes, we get a little excited. But then we're reminded that it's really a silly idea. I mean, life is what it is. We, we have to learn to deal with it. And you know what? We do learn to deal with it. And much like Cinderella, we find a way to even make the best of it, sadly, even becoming content with it, believing it is our destiny to be scrubbing floors while others go out dancing at the ball. Our expectations have been watered down. Life's fine wine has become fruit punch. We don't experience the fullness of life, the kind of life God wants us to know because we ultimately give up on wanting something we believe we either don't deserve or will never have. But God has a plan. And God sends grace into our lives and for a moment or two we can see clearly who we really are. We realize that through the cross that God has paid a price, has purchased our way to the party, and we go to the ball, and we dance with God. But then the clock strikes midnight, and the magic is gone, and suddenly we find ourselves back where we started, 
just the same as before. But God refuses to leave us scrubbing floors for the rest of eternity. And so God gets on a horse and begins to search the kingdom for we who are God's lost love. Door to door, God goes looking for the one who fits the glass slipper. We know the glass slipper fits our foot, but that voice inside begins to whisper, do you really think you are somebody special? Do you really think God loves you beyond your usefulness? Think back, look at your experience. You just aren't Prince Charming material. But that voice that plays deep within the core of our being is, is interrupted by a knock at the door. The knock of a God who is a stubborn romantic. The glass slipper fits and we turn and we walk away in the embrace of the great prince, the great God of the story, never to doubt our beauty, our worth, our love, ability ever again. Do you believe in fairy tales? Do you believe that's the way the story of your life ends? We are all Cinderella. And so you can leave this place and you can go out in the world and you can scrub floors or you can go out there and you can go to the ball and you can dance to your heart's delight. But even if you choose the first, or as we've said, if the dark side of your humanity convinces you that you're worthy of nothing more than one who was destined to scrub floors the rest of your life. I tell you today, God, the stubborn romantic, is relentless, and God will come looking for you, eventually knocking on your door. And when that glass slipper fits your foot, God will take you to be God's own. And you will live happily ever after. Amen. Amen.